Hello everyone, my name is Rishabh and this is the fourth video in the series of quantum mechanics. In the last video, we learned about Young's double slit experiment. We saw how Huygens wave model was the one that could explain the results of that experiment, the interference pattern. So by 1850s, we had pretty much figured out everything. We had Newton's laws that could explain the motion of objects around us, Kepler's laws to explain the motion of planets around the sun, we could explain the waves on strings, the ripples in the pond, and we had even found the relationship between electricity and magnetism. All this because of a set of carefully devised laws known as classical physics. But here comes the most beautiful thing about science. When you think you know everything, nature throws us new problems and questions. Over the next few years, a series of experiments would be performed that would completely change the course of science and the rigid concepts of classical physics would have to be pushed aside to make room for a new theory known as quantum mechanics. The first blow to classical physics came in the form of black body radiation. So in today's video, we are going to see what is black body and the radiation associated with it and how classical physics terribly fails to explain the black body spectrum. Before we start, make sure you subscribe to this channel and press the bell icon so that you don't miss any videos of this series. In the second half of the 19th century, that is from 1850s to 1900, what we were really trying to understand was how does radiation interact with matter. So the story began with a law given by a scientist named Kirchhoff. He said that every object at every instant emits electromagnetic radiation from its surface and at the same time also absorbs the radiation that is falling on it. Now suppose I have this pen in my hand. Light is falling on it, some of it is being absorbed while other is being reflected. Now how much a body absorbs radiation depends on the nature of the material. There are some good absorbers of light, for example coal, Venter black, etc., that absorb almost all the radiation that falls on them. And then there are some bad absorbers of light, for example, shining metal surfaces that just reflect most of the light that is incident on them. Now, just imagine a body that absorbs all the radiation that falls on it. There's a special name given to such an object a black body. So, a black body is, in principle, is something that absorbs all the radiation. Now you may ask that if that body is absorbing all the radiation and the temperature of that body is remaining constant, what is the radiation doing? The answer is nothing. That body is also emitting all the radiation that is falling on it. So by definition, a black body is not only a perfect absorber of radiation, but also a perfect emitter of radiation. Now before we go ahead, let me make it clear that a black body does not necessarily mean that its color is black. That body can be of any color. There is no relation with its apparent color. You may ask how to create such a body. It's very simple. All you have to do is to take a box, an opaque box like this. It can be of anything. It can be of wood, it can be of cardboard or a metal box, but it should be opaque. And you have to keep a small hole open through one of its faces. This is a black body. How? Any radiation that enters this body from this hole, okay? Any radiation that is falling on it from the hole is being reflected from the inner walls of the surfaces like this, this, this. It gets reflected from the inner surface multiple times before being completely absorbed in the box. So this is a black body. How? Any radiation that is falling on it is being absorbed by it, a perfect absorber of light. Now suppose this body is at a temperature T, okay? Temperature T. Any radiation that comes out through this hole is black body radiation. One particular thing to note about this radiation is that it only depends, the nature of the radiation only depends on the temperature of the box, that temperature of the radiation that is inside the box. It does not depend on the nature of the material that comprises that box. So if you found this concept a bit difficult to understand, let me give you a simple example. Remember, perfect black bodies do not exist in nature. We only have approximations of black bodies. For example, sun is considered to be a black body, stars are considered to be black bodies, 
a light bulb is considered to be a black body or even a metal surface can be considered to be a black body. Now let me give you an example okay. So suppose I have a piece of metal with me and I take it to a dark room. Can you see that metal in the dark room? Answer is no. Why? Because no light is falling on it, none of it is being reflected and hence we cannot see that metal in the dark room. But does that mean it is not emitting anything? No. According to Kirchhoff's law, every object at every instant emits electromagnetic radiation from its surface. So that object is indeed emitting electromagnetic radiation but it's not in the visible region and hence we cannot see that metal piece in the dark room with the naked eyes. That radiation is in the infrared region. So if you want to see that metal piece in the dark room, you will need infrared vision. Now suppose I start heating that metal piece, okay. Suppose I heat it to 1200 degrees Celsius. When I brought it in the room, in the dark, at the room temperature, say 30 or 35 degrees Celsius, there was no glow. At 1200 degrees Celsius, I see a dull red color. That metal starts glowing with a dull red color. I keep on increasing the temperature and see that as the temperature increases, the nature, the color of the glow also changes. At 1500 degrees Celsius, I see a bright red color. Then at 1700 degrees, I see an orange color. And finally at 2000 degrees Celsius and beyond, that color from orange changes to bright yellow and ultimately white. Now you can also do this experiment at home with a light bulb. All you have to do is to take a light bulb and connect it with a variable voltage source. When the voltage is zero, that is V is equal to zero, zero volts, you don't see the filament glowing. There is no glow. When you increase the voltage slowly, say about 20 volts, you see a dull red color of the filament. And finally at 30 volts and beyond, the filament, the color of the filament changes from dull red to bright yellow color. So, you see similar observations from both these experiments. So now what we are going to do is, we are going to plot these observations on a graph and see what we get. So I am going to draw a graph. Okay. Between wavelength lambda, let's suppose it's in nanometers and something I call u of lambda. For the time being, you can consider u of lambda to be intensity, okay? u of lambda is the intensity of the radiation. You can consider it for the timing. I'll tell the exact meaning later. So now we are going to draw these observations here, okay? Let me mark some points. So suppose this is 400 nanometers. This is 500, 600, 700, 800, okay? So this is the visible range. Visible range lies between roughly 400 nanometers to 800 nanometers, okay. When I brought that metal piece in the dark room, it was emitting in the infrared region. We could not see it with the naked eyes. So the peak intensity of the radiation was in infrared region. So at the room temperature, there is no glow here, 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 no glow. And then beyond 800 nanometers, I see here, a glow. Intensity of the radiation peaks beyond 800 nanometers in the infrared region. Then I see at 1200 degrees Celsius, I see a dull red color. Dull red color now belongs to 650 to 700 nanometers, roughly 700, 720 nanometers. Okay. So still no glow over these wavelengths. And then finally at around 700, I see a peak okay after that at 17 oh sorry at 1500 degrees celsius i see a bright color bright red color bright red color now is 600 to 650 nanometers roughly so i see an intensity curve like this after that 1700 degrees celsius orange this corresponds to around 600 to 620 nanometers. I'm talking about the rough values, not exact. So 600 nanometers like this. And finally, a bright yellow color at 2000 degrees Celsius roughly corresponds to 540, 550 nanometers. So you see like this. 
So this is the radiation curve that I get from the uh, observations of that experiment. Now do you see something very particular? Let me first mark the temperature ranges. This is at room temperature. Uh, this peak corresponds to 1200 degrees. This peak corresponds to uh, 1500. And then 1700. And finally, 2000 degrees Celsius. Okay, so I have marked the temperatures of the corresponding peaks. So one thing you should notice from this curve is the wavelength, okay, the wavelength at which we get the maximum intensity decreases as the temperature increases. So this was at 1200 degrees Celsius, right? And this corresponded to a peak of around 700 nanometers. But as the temperature increased, the wavelength at which we get the maximum intensity decreased. See, this is around 500 nanometers at 2000 degrees Celsius. And at 1200 degrees Celsius, we have around 750 to 700 nanometers. So what does this mean mathematically? Mathematically, lambda m, that is the wavelength at which we get the peak intensity, is inversely proportional to the temperature. When one increases, the other decreases. So when temperature is increasing, the wavelength is decreasing. Now we have to write it exactly what it means lambda m is equal to we replace this uh, proportionality sign with a constant 2.898 into 10 raised to power minus 3 this you can get from the graph itself upon t this relationship between lambda m and t is known as the Wien's displacement law. This lambda m and t, the relationship between these two quantities from the black body spectrum is known as Wien's displacement law. So this law is very important in astronomy also. How? You must have seen that the bluish and the white color stars, the O and B type stars in astronomy, they have a surface temperature of 30,000 degrees Celsius on average. Uh, whereas the M type stars, that are the red stars, the surface temperature of them is around 2500 to 3000 degrees Celsius. So redder stars have a lower surface temperature and white stars or the bluish white stars have higher surface temperatures. An observation that is uh, that fits the black body radiation observations. Okay, So this law is very important in astronomy also. Another law that was derived during this time from the experiments was Stephen's law. So Stephen's law says that the total energy, okay, the total luminosity or the total energy that is emitted from a black body per unit time, per unit area is directly proportional to the fourth power of temperature that is L luminosity or the total energy output is equal to sigma t raised to power 4. Here sigma is a constant. So this law was the one that helped us to calculate the surface temperature of the sun for the first time around 6000 degrees Celsius. So now we've got a couple of observations. The next step is to see how can we explain this experimental observations using theory. So what do we have to do exactly is we have to find the relationship between u of lambda and lambda that is relation between intensity and the wavelength or you can say you have to find a mathematical function that explains the nature and the shape of this curve okay so before we do that let me explain you the meaning of u of lambda exactly u of lambda is known as the energy density that is how much energy per unit volume is con contained in this small patch of radiation I'm calling, I'm taking a small strip of wavelength, d lambda. So how much energy is contained in this small strip of radiation is known as u of lambda per unit volume. So we have to find a relationship between this and wavelength. The first attempt to find the mathematical relationship between these two quantities was made by Wilhelm Wien himself. So Wien gave a, a distribution law, a nu cube e raised to power minus beta nu by t. This is in the terms of frequency. You can also convert it into the uh, terms of wavelength. A and beta are constants. 
Now the only problem with this empirical formula or this function is that it does not explain the curve at low frequencies. This formula fails at low frequencies. It only explains the curve at high frequencies. The second attempt to explain the black body spectrum was made by Rayleigh and Jeans. So they had a brilliant idea to explain the black body spectrum. They considered the black body radiation inside the box to be composed of standing waves. And these waves are produced by the oscillators, that is vibrating particles. These harmonic oscillators create standing waves. Now let me explain that graphically. So we know from Maxwell's equations, we can describe a wave, an electromagnetic wave with a sinusoidal wave like this. This is the amplitude A and this is the wavelength lambda, right? How many half wavelengths are present in one full wavelength? Two. Uh, lambda by two this and lambda by two this, okay? So they said that consider a cubical box of length L, okay? I'm going to draw it in one dimension. Consider this is one phase of a cubical box of length L. They said that inside this box, the black body radiation is in the form of standing waves. Now what are standing waves? Uh, when you have a string or a rope fixed at both ends and you plug that rope in the middle at a particular frequency, you see standing waves like these. Uh, they can have a form like this, okay? Or they can have a form like this. right or they can have a form like this now one thing you must note is that in these standing waves at the edges of the box of length l the amplitude of the wave must vanish there should not be any amplitude of the wave on the edges of the box and in terms of half wavelength you have to make a very important observation that is if you divide the length of the box L by the number of half wavelengths of the standing wave lambda by 2 you should always get an integer that is if you divide the length of the box L by half wavelengths how many half wavelengths are here in this only one right lambda uh, L divided by 1 is 1 so this contains 1 half 1 the value of m here it is 2 how many half wavelengths are present here 2 1 and 2. So the value of m here is 2, the value of m here is 3. That means if you divide the length of the box by the number of half wavelengths, you uh, by half wavelengths, you always get an integer m. Okay. So now what we have to do is we have to calculate the number of standing waves in this small frequency range nu and nu plus d nu. Remember we chose lambda and lambda plus d lambda that small strip of wavelength we chose this corresponds to that in terms of frequency so we have to calculate the number of standing waves in this small range Rayleigh and jeans did that and they came up with a number 8 pi nu square upon c cube this is the number of standing waves or the number of modes of vibration present in this small frequency range right now each of the standing wave has a different energy. Some of it uh, might have a very high energy or some of them might have very low energy. Now in order to find the total energy inside that box, you just have to find how much energy each of those waves has and just you have to add them. But we are not talking about 5 or 6 waves, right? We are not talking about 5, 6, 7 standing waves. We are talking about the number that can be of the order of 10 raised to power 40 or 10 raised to power 50, each having different energy. Now, adding such a big number is impossible. So we make an assumption. We say that each of these standing waves has the same energy. We associate an average energy to them, right? That average energy from the laws of classical thermodynamics comes out to be k into t. This is the average energy of the oscillate, uh, harmonic oscillator. k is known as the Boltzmann's constant and t is the temperature. So you just have to multiply this number with the number of standing waves and you will get the total energy density. So u of nu t is 
एट पाई न्यू स्क्वेयर अपॉन सी क्यूब नंबर ऑफ स्टैंडिंग वेव नंबर ऑफ मोड्स इन टू दिस नंबर के टी दिस इज द रेले जीन्स लॉ दैट रेले एंड जीन्स कैलकुलेटेड द एनर्जी डेंसिटी ऑफ द ब्लैक बॉडी स्पेक्ट्रम ओके दिस इज द फॉर्मूला दे गेव but it's a disaster so if you carefully look at this formula you will see that there is a flaw in it that is if you integrate this formula over all the frequencies to find out the total energy density you will see that this integral diverges that is since it contains new square term it diverges at higher frequencies this means at higher frequencies the amount of energy emitted by a black body is infinite physically this means if you have a bread and you put it in your toaster that bread will always burn no matter what the temperature of the toaster is so the concept of infinite energy at higher uh, at higher frequencies was pretty absurd so even rayleigh and jeans could not explain the black body spectrum though they started off brilliantly the third and the last attempt to explain the black body spectrum was made by max planck german physicist also known as the father of quantum mechanics in the next video we'll see how max planck found a flaw in this formula and how he rectified it and successfully explained the black body spectrum the core idea or the core concept of quantum mechanics is hidden in planck's explanation to the black body spectrum if you like this video make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss any future videos of this series thank you